So godly parenting, lesson one, God's original intent for children. So now this is our, God's original intention, what he originally established them for. Because, <laughs> you know, especially with nowadays, everybody gets into the mindset of, well, your child should do this, your child should do that. Every child should go to college. But what if God didn't ordain college for your child? And some people say, well, college, you don't, you don't have to go to college. You don't need to go to college. There's no sense in it. Well, what if God ordained them to go to college? You, we've got to have the mindset of everything is about God. Nothing is about our own choice of what we desire. Because, you know, we can say, well, you know, this is Independence Day. We're, we were set free. We're, we're in a free nation. Yes. And you look at it and we've run it in the ground. Amen, yeah. Because we were founded on Christian principles, Christian foundation of this nation, and what have we done with it? Now, granted, we are, I believe, the best nation on the planet. I still believe that. But we, if you look at America today, and you look at America 50, even 20 years ago, we're not the same nation that we used to be. Why? Because what we have done is we've taken everything from a focus on God and we keep dwindling it down to where now all the focus is on you. It's on you. Or for, for the sake of clarity, it's all about me. It's all the sake of, well, every commercial is how you, what you want, what you desire. So everything is about that. You know, now I get, I get irritated when I see emails when somebody sends me something, and then below it it will have their name at the signature area, and then it says, like, he, him. He, him, you got to tell me you're a he when your name is Adam? That was the first man that was created. So I think by God's design, Adam, yeah, he's got boy parts, that's a he. Yes, there's no question about that. <laughs> so the intention, bringing it back to our lesson now, our intention for our children should be whatever God's intention for our children is. It's not what we want them to be. Some people live vicariously through their children. Because they couldn't be the football star, they want to make their child the football star. Because they couldn't be the top cheerleader, they want their child to be the top cheerleader. Nowadays, either boy or girl. But anyway, well, let's get into our lesson before I start preaching. So, children come from God, and that comes from Genesis 4.1. So, automatically, right out the gate, children come from God. Yes, you do have reproductive organs. Yes, you can create that. But God is the one that says, all right, this sperm has planted in this egg and that child is born. Because if it wasn't, both could be sterile. There could be issues there. But children come from God. That is a blessing. Now, just as sin is our choice, so is having a child. You can choose to sin like you can choose to have a child in some degree. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, if you don't want a child because you're not married, don't have sex. Getting awful religious in this church of Christ this morning. <laughs> so that's, that's, the, that's the reason we save ourselves for our wedding night. So, you know, if all of a sudden you surprise, you've at least been married and, you, and that child was conceived on your honeymoon. I mean, you know, granted, you know, I think ideally you want, you know, a little bit of space in there for you, for a husband and wife to get to know each other, to spend that time. But every situation is different. So, but in the overall bigger picture, children are from God, especially with abortion. People say, well, I want to get rid of this thing on the inside of me. That thing is a gift from Jesus Christ, even out of your rebellion, even out of your sin, that thing that you declare is a, is a, human being on the inside of you so that gift is from god even out of your sin can you can still receive a wonderful precious gift and it's up to you to take care of it but they are a heritage from him psalm 127 verse 3 they're a heritage from god he breathes into every man the breath of life genesis 2 7 and he is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, John 1, 9. 
He has a plan for every child before they were even born, Jeremiah 29, 11. He has a plan before the child is even born. So every one of us, before we were born, God had a plan for us. God has a plan for every child that's about to be born or will be born in the future. There is a plan and a purpose for them. So it's, this is why parenting is so important that we understand what God's plan and purpose is for our child and to put that into them. Amen. So, for He knows them before they were conceived, Jeremiah 1.5. So God knows them and He knows their characteristics. He knows you know, their way of life. He knows their way of thinking. He knows the way that He has created them. So it's up to parents to be able to figure out that gift of God that's in them, pray about it, receive and have a revelation from God, and then to parent them correctly. You do not parent every child the same. Different ch children receive different parenting. That's like even with our three boys, we parent them differently. Because you got one that's more, you know, kind of reserved and, and is bold about some things, but is kind of reserved, so we have to, you know, pull him out to speak up about things. And then you got another one who's bold about everything, and we're having to tame him a little bit to say, all right, you don't have to speak everything. You don't have to you know, stand on the mountain and defend everything. You, know, you can calm it down just a little bit. You know, I, I love your boldness, but you know, calm down just a little bit and, and choose when the appropriate time is for you to stand up and to be loud and to declare things. Amen. But so every, every child should be parented differently. So we are to raise our children up for God, and then commend them back to Him. This reminds us, reminds us of Hannah in the Bible when she prayed for Samuel. She prayed and prayed and prayed, and God gave her a baby, gave her Samuel, and what did she do? She raised him up until he was done nursing from her, and then what did she do? She took him back to the house of God and commended him and gave him to the prophet. And she said, All right, God, you've given me this child I've been able to raise him for you know, the certain amount of time where he no longer needs you know, my, the nutrition from me. Now he can sustain you know, on his own. He can eat on his own, we would say. And then she commends him back to God. And so that takes, that takes a true heart of a parent to be able to say, you've given me this gift. I've done what I can with it. Now I'm giving it back to you. This is why it's important for us to parent correctly. Because what if we put something in that child that God doesn't want? Now, somebody else is going to have to come along and disciple that child and get that back out of them. Or, we can put things, in, we, can, we can take things out of them that God has put in them. Now, somebody has to come along and disciple that child, you know, maybe as an adult now, and disciple them to put that back in them. Like, like, say, take one of our, our boys, if, if they had this boldness about the things of God, then all of a sudden, I didn't, you know, I didn't understand that as a father, and I began to disciple that out of him. Somebody along the lines is going to have to come back and do restorative discipleship and put that back into him. But whose fault was it that it came out? It would be mine. So we must realize the gift of God on each child as a parent or a grandparent and we put the Word of God into them first and foremost, not our opinions, not our desires, but we put what God wants in them and on them in their life and pull things out of them as in it, the gift of God that's in them. We pull that out to, for them to use it, not completely pull it out and take it away, but to pull it out for them to use it, to display it. But we also pull the bad out to say, no, 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 we don't do that. We, we're not doing that. And then we put good in. Amen. We need to view our children as on loan from God Almighty. They're on loan to us. Amen. They are His children, a reward from Him. Psalm 127 verse 3. In essence, having children is ultimately not about us, but about God. So although they, they become ours and the government sees them as ours, we're to support them, we're to take care of them, but they're ultimately from God. For all things are created by Him and for Him. So not only are they created by Him, but now they're created by Him and for Him. That means they're to be used for His purpose, His plan, His kingdom. So Colossians 1.16. 
So we should put God in them and not us. This is the danger of tradition. Well, daddy did it this way. Well, granddaddy did it this way. Well, my great, 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 great granddaddy did it this way. Well, that doesn't mean it's God. That means that maybe that's a tradition passed down that you've kept in your family, but that does not mean it's God. So we must, as parents and grandparents, and we must realize that we are to put God in them and not us and not our traditions and not our culture of our flavor of our family. Now, can you have a little bit of that? Absolutely. There's going to be things of the Andrews that my boys will take along, but it's, it's one of those things to where if it conflicts with God, God outranks anything. So God outweighs anything. Will there be little, you know, little inside jokes or little things like that that you know, my boys will take on and pass to their family? Probably. But I pray that, that God never has to take anything out of them that I put in them. And I pray that I'm able to put everything in them that God wants in them. Amen. That's the heart of what I'm trying to say. So we will look at many elements of life and learning involved with parenting in the lessons to come. But in this lesson, we want to look at the overall big picture of God's original intent for children. There is certainly a huge element of joy, sorrow, trials, errors, growth, rejoicing, pride, embarrassment, <laughs> An elation that belongs to parents, but we must not forget that parenting begins with God and is intended to end with His glory. Amen. Because everything we do should be to His glory. So any study on the family must begin in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis grants us insight into God's purpose and vision for the institution of family, including children. So Genesis 1, 27 and 28 says, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Notice it's only male and female. There's no other, other genders listed. It's either a male or female. How can we screw this up? We have somehow found a way to mess it up. <laughs> and God blessed them. Why? Because they were just male and female. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say this to two guys or two girls. He said it to a man and a woman. Because parts is parts, and that's the only way it's going to work. <laughs> and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God made mankind in his image, and he made mankind to be male and female. His first commandment to mankind was be fruitful, branch off, and multiply, become great. So here, the very first thing he tells a man and a woman, a husband and wife, Adam and Eve, the first thing he tells them is to go have sex and create children and to populate the earth. Why? Because there's a lot of work to be done. It's all for God's glory. God had created the heavens and the earth. He wanted us to take care of it. He put us in charge in it. So we need help. So, but everything we're doing is going to glorify God because God's put us in charge of this area. He's put us in charge of this domain. So we're going to have kids. We're going to populate the earth, and we will be able to do what He's created us to do, which is to have dominion over the earth and give Him glory and honor. So the first thing was have children. Why? Replenish the earth and subdue it. Here we see that the original purpose of children was to accomplish the will of God, to replenish and subdue the earth. Children are given to us for God's will, not merely for our enjoyment. Our enjoyment is part of it, but God gives us children for His purpose. And this is why you don't get mad when you have a child and after they're born and they get on your nerves, you don't get mad at them and treat them horribly because now you are dishonoring the gift that God has given you. That'd be like, you know, somebody that you really love letting them borrow, you know, they let you borrow their car, their prized vehicle, and then all of a sudden you just take it and you just run through the mud, you just hit every pothole that you can, you run it into a fence and then you back it up and then you ram it into a brick wall and then you take it and then, you know, right before you take it back to them, you take it and you take a garden hose and you kind of rinse it off and say, all right, I brought your car back to you. They're going to say, what in the world have you done? So why don't we see our kids that way? 
Because something that is so precious to God as a child, I mean, even Jesus, when the disciples were trying to hold the, the children back, he said, no, 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 you let them come to me. You let them come to me. Because that's how precious children are to God, to, to God the Father, to Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Spirit. So if we know that children are that important to God, why would we treat them any less, any less standard than God would? Amen. So Why? Man is made in God's image. Man has been given the authority over the earth. By having children, mankind is supposed to be training up future generations that will walk closer with God and accomplish more for God than the preceding generation did. You know, that's like, you know, the, the word says that children are supposed to be the arrows in your quiver. Well, what, what's an arrow in the quiver? Well, you pull it out and you don't just go... You don't just shoot it right near your foot so they don't go anywhere. What you do is you pull that arrow out and you launch it because you say, this is as far as I am right now and I need you to go further than I can go. So you put the Word of God, you put the Spirit of God, you put the obedience of, to God in their heart and their life and you're able to pull that back and you can say, look, this may be as far as I'm going but I'm going to send you further than I can ever go and may you send your children further than you can go. And with that, you get generation after generation that becomes more on fire for God. And you see a lineage of nothing but just on fire, Holy Ghost filled, you know, children and parents just working that chain to create a lineage like Asaph. If you study Asaph in the, in the Bible, there was generations that led praise and worship all because Asaph was committed to doing his job of leading praise and worship for David. But there's generation. Do you see generation after generation after generation after generation you know, of Asaph worshipers and Asaph like in his lineage of worshipers? You see that lineage and you ha have the heart of that. So obviously that was taught from generation, 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 generation. And not only was it, we would say, a tradition, but when something important was going on, they would call them up and the Spirit of God would fall because of that lineage, still had the heart, not the action. They had the heart of what was to be done. Amen. So God wants us to replenish the earth with children after his likeness who will grow up and accomplish his will in the earth. To that end, we must ask ourselves, is my parenting fulfilling God's original intent for children? So God gives us children so that he may have a generation that subdues the earth. Now, I know in this next section, this is not going to be popular in this region. So I'm going to put this out there. You can be offended at me if you want to. I really don't care. Wouldn't be the first time somebody's got offended at me. And I know it won't be the last because when you stand on the truth of God, people get offended. But... Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they that love thy law, or we would say the word of God, and nothing shall offend them. So if this next part offends anybody, whether hopefully not here, maybe streaming, maybe whatever in the future, if, if, if you see this and this offends you, that means that that is your God in your life, and you need to correct it with God and not be offended at me. Anyway, so with a smile, we'll cover this next section. A child's life is more than just soccer and video games. A child's life is more than just soccer and video games. When God revealed himself to Israel through the law of Moses, he took the opportunity to remind mankind of his original intent for children. All parenting begins with the parents. That's why it's called parenting. Because <laughs> I've, I've known children where they grew up and their parents gave them, you know, some electronic and said, here you go, you know, go, just leave me alone, just go be quiet, just go do this. And then they grow up like that, and then when they're a teenager and they're not taking anything to their mom and dad, they wonder why. Well, why don't my, why doesn't my child talk to me? Well, probably because they spent their whole life not talking to you because you were up your phone's rear end and on social media and doing all these other things. Pardon the expression, that's, that's how aggravated I feel about it, and I know God is too. 
how you can be on your little thing because it's all about you. You don't, you don't care about your kids and you focus on your own life, your own social life. You focus on these things. You put that in your kids and then wonder why your kids are going to hell. I told you, if you get offended, just take it up with God. Because when parents are poor parents and then they wonder why their kids turn out the way they do, it's because of you, mom and dad. Now, I'm not just saying this to beat up on parents, period. I'm saying this so we might be accurate, but I've seen many kids grow up, and then when they get to a certain age, their parents look to you know, Miss Tiffany and I, and they say, hey, can you help us with our kids? We've got this going on. They won't come to us, and they've got this, and they're just out of hand. And then they expect us to turn around. We get them on track for God, and then what happens? The parents, oh, you don't need to go to church that much. You don't need to do that. You don't need to. Then quit sending me your kids. Because if you don't love God and have a walk with God on your own, I'm not going to fix your kids. If I do fix your kids, if I do disciple them, then let the Word of God continue to grow in them and don't root it out and throw it away. Because... I mean, it's, it's happened on more than one, one, one or two occasions that Miss Tiffany and I have put so much word and so much effort and so much of the Spirit of God into different people's lives just to turn around and for those same people that were at their wit's end needing help, they turn around and, and tear everything down that we put into them. And they see, they make a comment on what the difference is in their child and how blessed they are, but then they do the same thing. So I'm saying all of that to tell you we have experience in this. This is not just, well, pastor's upset about that. Well, the Word says it. No, no, no. I've seen it from my own eyes on more than three occasions. So to know, to know from experience and to know from the Word of God, and that out trumps any experience, but to put all of these pieces together, I know what I'm talking about. So if you trust the process, if you trust the man of God, let the work of God and the Word of God, the Spirit of God, do its thing, and everybody receives the benefits from it. Amen. So Deuteronomy 4, 9 and 10 says, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Teach them thy sons. So that means you don't hold it to yourself and you don't hold it just to your kids. You teach it to your grandkids. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together and I will make them hear my words. Now, you can hear, but obeying is two different things. That they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. On the mountain of God, just days after Israel's deliverance from Egypt, God wastes no time commanding Israel how they will serve Him. God's commanding them and telling them, this is how you're going to serve me. <laughs> so I, I think it's funny because people you know, get upset about maybe the standard you know, that I have or whatever, but I'm like, look, if, it's, if my standard is too high for you, then you might, you, know, you might as well change your heart because you're not going to add up to God's standard. Because I'm still a man. I've still got faults. I've still got issues. So if you think my standard is too high, you've got to look at God's standard. Now, does that mean it's impossible? No, not at all. Because even the Word says all things are possible with God. So that tells you. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, that means that any part of the standard that we can't perfect or mature in our own, we rely on God. Father, give me grace. Give me grace. Help me with this area of my life. Fill in the gaps that I'm imperfect. But if you look at it from, if you stand back and look at the standard of, of living, the way even that God prescribes that we do, the enemy will use that to get in your mind and to make you so full of doubt and so full of fear that you won't even try. That's exactly what he wants. Because if you never try, then you'll never realize the blessing that's in it, even when you're attempting to, you know, we've all had kids and grandkids 
when you've, you know, they brought you a coloring page or they brought you a drawing. You say, oh, well, this is neat. What is this? And you're thinking it's like, you know, a dinosaur. And they say, oh, well, that's you, Daddy. Oh, okay, that's kind of weird. I didn't remember having a long tail or whatever. That They attempted to make a picture. They attempted to do something good. And so with that, as a, as a, as a parent or grandparent or, or whoever you're receiving that from, you see that and you see the attempt. You see the heart that says, I made this for you. I wanted to do my best for you. But just because it wasn't a Picasso or just because it wasn't a Van Gogh or whatever, you don't start saying, well, that was horrible. You need to try this over. You're a horrible student. You're a horrible artist. You just need to quit. No, 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 no. That's not what we do. That's not the way God is either. God sees that attempt, and he says, you know what? This is where they're at, but a few years later, he'll see how much you've grown and how much of an artist you've become with your life, of allowing him to paint on your life, allowing him to do things in your life, and then, you look, he, then you're able to look back a few years and say, man, that wasn't such a good picture, but look at this picture now. It's gotten better. It's gotten better. And God says, yeah, just wait a few more years because I know the plans and the purposes I have for you. And I know how well this picture is going to end if you'll keep listening to me, keep allowing the word of God and my, and my spirit to be in you to see how far you can go. And then you go from that picture to the end of your time to when you first started. It's completely night and day. But it's all about the attempt. It's all about the heart of saying, I'm trying. I'm putting, my, I'm putting my best effort to it. I'm doing what I can. Father, help me make up the rest. But I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. But the enemy wants you to never try. To say, oh, it's too much. It's too hard. It's too hard. It's too hard. You know, many people, <laughs> well, some people, I'll say, let me back that up. Some people you talk to, you talk about going to church or doing different things for God. Well, I tried that religion thing and it was too hard. That's not about religion. It's about having a relationship with God. You know, it's like having a relationship with anybody. It takes work, yes, because you've got to communicate. You've got to spend time with that person. You've got to put, your, put forth the effort from you to be in that relationship. It's the same with God. You don't just come and you know, dance around and throw money in the offering and raise your hands and then all of a sudden go home and then that's supposed to be religion. No, 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 that's what religion is, but that's not a walk with God. So raising a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and raising them up and teaching them the standard of God would seem like an impossible task if you look at it on paper, if you look at it in a carnal mindset. But if you look at it through the eyes of God, all he's saying is just teach them what I've taught you. Put the word that I've given you into them. Because God doesn't expect you to, to know everything from, about the Bible front to back and to, to put it all in them and to cram it into your kids or your grandkids. He just expects you to take what you've taught, what you've been taught from, you know, from him, from your own Bible time, and from maybe your pastor or other spiritual leaders, to put it up in, in bite-sized bits and, and give it to your kids. Because one day they're going to have a pastor that they can you know, feed off of. Then they'll still have you as a parent or grandparent, and they'll continue to grow. And we, if we put into them what we've learned, we're already getting them to where we are, and we can send them further. So it's all about that attempt and that walking with God and doing our best to put God in them. So God does not deliver people for, for them to live to themselves. God does not deliver people for them to live for themselves. Because when God delivers us from sin, He delivers us from the enemy, why would He say, all right, now, you go do what you want to. If you want to turn around and go back, you can. I mean, ultimately, he, he gives us that option because we're free moral agents. But he sets us free. He gives us, he delivers us that we may go and be blessed and to be with him. So one of God's first dealings with Israel is concerning their soul and their parenting. So their soul and their parenting. That's the two things that God addresses right out the, right out the gate. <laughs> it wasn't. Their soul and something else. It was their soul and their parenting. Because he says, if you can get your soul right and you parent properly, I won't have to deal with your kids the way I dealt with you. Why? Because they've already learned those lessons from you. 
You know, that's you know, different things I've learned. I've tried to teach you know, my boys, you know, one of them being running from the calling of God or different things that you know, I, I tried that. Yep, it didn't work. So just don't even try. When God says this, just do it. Just do it. Amen. So one of, see, one of God's first dealings with, with Israel concerning their soul and their, and their parenting, God said, keep your heart right before me and teach your children to do the same. Keep your heart right before me and teach your children to do the same. If you have a sour attitude and a sour heart towards God, it'll, it'll show in your kids. That is why when you read Timothy and Titus, when it talks about the qualifications for church leaders, one thing to look at is their kids. Because a, a man that can't rule his own house well, how can he rule in the house of God? How can he rule the things of God? Because if you're, you're, especially for men, your wife and your children are to be your best disciples. That's, I'm not saying that to con- condemn anybody. I'm saying you know, when you have things in order, then they should be your best disciples. Now, does that mean that like, as soon as you get married or as soon as you have kids, they're just you know, prim and proper and got everything together? No, no, no. It takes time. It takes time, just like anything else. It takes time. And there will always be something to work on. But it's, it's that knowing that this is my job. This is what I'm to do. I'm to make them a disciple. Just like when Jesus first called his disciples, they didn't have it all together. Even when he was crucified, they didn't have it all together. <laughs> I mean, you had one plainly denied him three times, and the other one's just scattered like a bunch of cockroaches. I mean, they all... Re- None of them were bold like they said they were going to be. But guess what happened? They made it right and they become the apostles and they carried out the rest of their lives being the true disciples of the Lamb, the true disciples of Jesus Christ to carry the Word of God, to make more disciples and to multiply and to build the kingdom of God. Amen. So it's not about having it right as soon as you come out the gate. But it's about staying steady in that process and building those disciples. Even grandparents are commanded to teach their sons sons. So 40 years later, right before the the new generation of Israelites was about to possess the promised land, Moses reiterates God's twofold commandment of parenting. Keep your heart right before me and teach your children to do the same. So Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7 and 11 and 19 says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently to sharpen unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Deuteronomy 11.21 says, That your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. So these verses give us six good steps for successful training our children, for successfully training our children to fulfill the will of God their entire lives. Their entire lives. So number one, the commandments of God must be in the parent's heart to begin with. It's got to start with us as parents and grandparents. It's got to start with us. You know, because how can you, you know, teach anybody else if you don't have it within you? You know, much like I know this may be a silly example, but I mean, in an airplane and stuff, when they go through their little safety brief, they tell you not to help your neighbor first. They tell you to put the mask on yourself so that you can help somebody else. Same goes with salvation. You use salvation, you use the Word of God, you use the Spirit of God on yourself, and then you're able to help somebody else. Because if you don't, You'll be just like those in the last times and the end times that look at Jesus and say, well, didn't we cast these out in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? He says, I never knew you. Because you're too busy worried about helping somebody else, but you don't have what you need first. Amen. So the commandments of God must be in our hearts to begin with. Because when it's in your heart, then you're, you're apt just to share at any given moment. Because when it's in your heart, it just flows out of you. Amen. You know, that's like you see, you know, different kids are raised up to, you know, learn to appreciate maybe a certain ball team or this sport or that sport or hunting or fishing or whatever. Why? Because it was in their parents. There was something in them that they saw and they said, hey, I want to be like mom and daddy. You know, a child, while we're on this, a child 
grows up thinking the best of their parents until their parents ruin that reputation. You know, I've, I've you know, witnessed you know, quite a few young people that as they got older, they said, you know what, my parents, I really wanted to be like them when I was little, but the more I realized who they were, the less I wanted to be like them. But whose fault is that? It's the parents. So with that kind of attitude, we could apply it in a positive sense and say if the Word of God is in us, if there's you know, things of God in us, it will come out and it will rub off on our children. They'll begin to love to learn the, to, learn to uh, do the things of God and to love the things of God. They'll, they'll love it because we've taught them to love it. They'll say, Mom and Daddy, Mom and Daddy loves God. And I see how much they're blessed. I see all this in their life. I see that in their life. Man, I want that. And that, because they want to be like mom and dad or, gra- or grandma and grandpa, and so they, they carry that attitude of, I want that. But if you teach them the proper heart, it's not a, well, I go to church because my parents told me I had to and because they went. No, it's a heart after God. <laughs> That's what has made this whole region in the South so religious and the Bible Belt is because it's more about tradition than it is about walking with God. So number two, parents are to sharpen, as with a whetstone, their child with the Word of God. You sharpen them. doesn't mean that you sharpen them and, and beat them with it, as in, oh, what's that verse? Oh, you're wrong. I'm going to beat you now. No, 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 we don't do that. Or, you did this wrong, and the Word says you don't do that. We don't beat them like that. We sharpen them. You say, the Word of God says, no, we, we don't do that. So let's... let's Let's talk about this. What does, what does the Word of God say that we're to do? Like, well, let's, let's take for, you know, maybe a silly example. Uh, if, if, if I have two of my boys, they get angry at each other. Well, okay, the Bible says to be angry and sin not. So is the anger the sin? No, it's the reaction after the anger. All right, so if we can get down to the root of why are you angry? Because I don't want to teach them, well, you can never get angry. You can never get, the Bible says you're not supposed to be angry. No, that's not what it says. Bible says, be angry, but sin not. So you have a right. All right, what's, what's the cause? What's the issue? Well, he did this to me. All right, well, you have a right to be upset. All right, so now we're all on the same page. They say, all right, my anger is not the problem, but how I handle it may be the problem. All right, so how did you, what did you do when you got angry? Well, this is what I did. I hit him in the face. All right, well, let's not do that anymore. Although the other brother is supposed to turn another cheek, let's not do that. <laughs> So what we do is we handle it this way. And you begin to expound upon the Word of God to teach them how to control their emotions. That's the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. And then you produce that in your life and you carry yourself the way that God wants us to carry yourself. So we begin, but it's got to be taught. So you sharpen your children with the Word of God because just to tell them, well, this is the way you do it. Well, why? Because I said so. That only lasts for so long. But if you give them the Word of God and say, well, the Word of God says this, then that maybe they can, you explain not only from the Word, but you explain the heart of that. Then they're apt to say, oh, yeah, that's why I don't do that. Amen. So number three, parents are to talk about the Word of God with their child when they are in the home. We have some of our best conversations around our kitchen, our dining room table. That's some of our deepest theological discussions. It's usually not at church. It's usually, you know, like as far as with our kids and things, it's, it's usually at that dinner table or sitting on the couch or whether we're watching something and all of a sudden the boys have a question, we'll pause the TV because the TV doesn't r- rule our house. It's the response I thought I'd get. Amen. <laughs> Because there's times I come in and the TV's just on. There's nothing horrible on it. I said, no, 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 let's, let's turn that off. That's, it's, it's, dis, it's disturbing me. Because I'm one of those where just because we're home, the TV doesn't have to be on. Anyway, coming back to this. We have those moments to where if you, if you can allow yourself, you can easily bypass is probably what I'm wanting to say. It's a better way to say it. You can easily bypass precious moments with your children 
in, in teaching them the Word of God if you overlook it and are not seeing it in the bigger picture. But there are many opportunities that you can take just you know, a few moments or take as long as you need to, as long as you want to, to put the Word of God in them at any given time. Because children, I don't know if you know this, but children were designed to learn. Why? Because it makes them better adults. Amen. Which is why we have so many crazies out here now. Because they weren't properly parented. Because nobody took the time to teach them and to help them. They just told them that it's all about you. It's all about what you want to do. Or their parents said, well, you go do this because I'm doing this. Amen. But you teach them, you talk about the Word of God with your child when you're in the home. Number four, parents are to talk about the Word of God with their child when they go about their day. Any, just any given moment during the day. You know, I, I may, you know, of course, I work from home a lot more now, and so I'll be downstairs, be doing things, and, you know, unless I'm, I've got, you know, I'm zoned in on something that's really important that I've got to answer because there's times that I've, if I don't, it may be a bigger mistake than what my company needs. So I try to stay focused on that. But if there's, if I'm just in the middle of something else and it's not so dead serious, you know, if the boys come in, they have a question for me or something like that, I try to pause what I'm doing and try to answer that. Because why? Because there's been a couple of times where I couldn't, and then I go back to talk to one of the boys, and they're like, oh, well, don't worry about it. No, 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 son. No, no, no. No, I, this because you brought it. You brought. You were coming to me about something. I want to hear what this is. I don't want them to ever feel like, well, daddy's too busy for me, or daddy can't do this for me, or daddy doesn't want to listen to me. No, no, no. That's not it. There's sometimes that you got to focus, but then there's other times we, as parents and grandparents, we have to make that right to follow up with them to say what you have to say is important to me. Especially because you'll find that, you know. Well, I found with my boys that a lot of times there will be a spiritual question in behind that. But what if I didn't follow up with that? What if I didn't take that moment to, to stop what I'm doing and to focus on them to answer their spiritual question? How much have I just stunted their spiritual growth? Amen. So number five, parents are to talk about the Word of God with their child as they lay them down to sleep. This doesn't just mean that you pray that little prayer Oh, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. No, 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 no. That's, first of all, that's like, what's the word I'm looking for? Morbid. <laughs> it's like saying, rock a baby. The cradle will fall. Who in the world comes up with this junk? I'm going to sing this to a baby as they're going to sleep. Weirdo. <laughs> but no, we talk about the things of God before we lay them down to sleep. Here's, here's a good explanation of why. If you catch the heart of this, you'll, you'll understand and you may want to do it more. Because if you lay them down and they're focused on the good things of God, as the Word tells us, the pure things, the lovely things, as the Scripture talks about, then what are they going to dream about? What are they going to be focused on as they're going to sleep? The pure, the lovely, the good things of God, which, roots, which, which puts away nightmares, it puts away different things, you know, out of their mind that the enemy would try to use against them. But parents are to talk about the Word of God with their child the first thing in the morning. What's a better way to start off your day than talking about the things of God? You know, I love it. There's, there's specific days, and, and it doesn't always happen 100% of the time, but it happens more times than not, that, you know, Elijah and I, we get up on certain mornings. We have a set time, roughly a certain little window, depending on how late we have to stay up. But we'll get up on certain days and we'll have Bible studies together. To me, that's precious. I love that. Because that's, that's us saying, all right, we're getting up. And sometimes, you know, he's studying his own thing. I'm studying my own thing. But to know that we're there and we can talk, we can ask questions, we can, you know, interact, and then we can go back to our study, just knowing that that opportunity is there and that desire is there to do that first thing in the morning means so much. Because honestly, I never had that with my dad. Now, did my dad love God? He still does. He loves God. Did he study the Word of God? A lot. But it was, you know, and I look back and I think about that, that, you know, maybe that's one thing that I wish, you know, he and I could have done together. Maybe we would do, you know, one day. 
but having those, having those moments to where we're able to sit at the table and study together, that's precious. But you've got to notch out time. You've got to make the effort. It, it won't just happen. You've got to put forth the effort into it. So number seven, bonus. Parents get to enjoy a long life and ensure that their children enjoy a long life too. <laughs> well, how's that, Pastor? From Deuteronomy 6, we learned that parenting is more than just video games. So excuse me, I was getting ahead of myself there. How do we learn that from the last point, the bonus? Because if you teach them to honor the things of God, to love the things of God, then they'll honor you. They'll honor the father and the mother, which is the first commandment with promise. But you teach, that, you teach them to honor the things of God, then God's going to honor that. He's going to honor them with long life. He'll honor you with long life because you are teaching them to honor the things of God. So there is a full circle of promises here to where when you do what God's told you to do, you honor Him, you honor your heavenly Father, we could say, and then they honor you because they want to do what you're doing. So they're honoring father and mother, and they're also honoring the heavenly Father. Then you see all of this long life with promise. Amen. So coming back to this, from Deuteronomy 6, we learn that parenting is more than just being a video game buyer or sports practice chauffeur. <laughs> the Ten Commandments. God's concern for children is reflected in the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 12, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So once again, long life is tied to child's training. If you want your child to live long, then train them correctly in the Word. A child can only honor if they have been taught to honor. A child can only honor if they are taught to honor. I, I, I'm going to tell off on some people. I'm not going to say their names. But when we first, when Ms. Tiffany and I first started coming here, there is a slide on our announcements now, and it's there for a reason. One, not to wear a hat in the sanctuary. Two, not to chew gum in the sanctuary. Three, not to eat and drink in the sanctuary. All of these things happened within the first couple months of me pastoring here. So what I do? I said, all right, I'm not going to preach on it and harp on it. I'm just going to put up a nice little slide so we can say, don't do this in the sanctuary. Can you do it in the foyer? Yeah, I mean, we'll let that slide because you're, at least you're in the house of God. You've come. Maybe you're running late. You need to you know, eat. You know, a little something before you come into the sanctuary so you're not hungry or feeling sick. All right, we'll, we'll let that slide. But in the sanctuary, in the place where we honor God, the, the altar of God, the, the pulpit of God, the holy place of God, there's a difference than here than you know, eating at Hardee's or eating at McDonald's. But honor will only come out if honor has been taught. So what do we do? wrote a whole curriculum on honor. We put it up up here to let everybody know to be on the same page. Didn't condemn the person. Didn't jump on to them. Didn't, I don't think I really said much to them because I didn't want them to feel that, that, that burden of, oh, I'm never coming back here because they're mean. No. We tried to instill honor and disciple that in a specific way to not be rude or in, the, in your face. But if you put it in, it should come out. But if you don't put it in, it won't come out. Amen. So children will honor whatever and whom honor, whomever they are taught to honor. So children will honor whatever and whomever they are taught to honor. You know, not, not so many years ago, I know I'm running over, but it's okay. You know, not so many years ago, even a preacher was respected by pagans. The house of God, the property of God was respected by pagans. Because it was taught to them. Look, we may not go there. We may not worship their God. But we're going to honor them because we don't want God on, on, you know, against us. But the Word does say if you're, if you're of the world and you're not a friend of God, if you're not on His side, then you are His enemy. But I think it kind of consoled their mind and their heart to say, well, I'm not dishonoring God, so maybe I'll be okay. <laughs> anyway, whatever the logic was, that hasn't been so many years ago, but now you see there's no respect for anybody. So part of parenting is instilling in your child what God does and does not want them to honor. The length of one's life is dependent on what they honor. So honor what God honors. 
The following activities are neutral. So that means they're neither here, they're not against God, but they're not for God. But they do not add to the kingdom of God. Also note that these are almost all entirely Western activities. So video games, television, sports, ballet, dance, gymnastics, beauty pageants, drama, 4-H, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, outdoors and sportsman activities. These activities should never consume a child's life. I'm going to say that again because I know we're in a religious region. And so I just really want to drive this home for us. These activities should never consume a child's life. God has given us all things richly to enjoy, but God should always take preeminence over all of these. If you teach a child that sports is more important than God, they'll grow up that way and they'll never change their heart. You teach them that hunting and fishing is more important than God, they'll grow up that way, they'll never change their heart. You teach them that video games, television, whatever they want to do is more important than God, they'll never change their heart. Well, daddy and mama taught me this was okay. So it's important for us to not allow the things of the world to trump the things of God. Because when it all boils down to it, those things won't get that child into eternity. God will. I know, I know, I've heard lots of testimonies, I've seen it for myself, how steeped this region is in sports. Well, if you're not sports, you're not anybody. I say it's a hell with your sports. Because that's where you're sending your child if you put that more on them than God. If you put hunting and fishing more on your child, to hell with your hunting and fishing. Now, as we said just a moment ago, these things are neutral. Those are good hobbies. Those are good things. But if they outweigh God, you've taught them to honor that more than God, you're going to send your child to hell. And then wonder all along the way, what could I have done? What did I do? What did I do? What did I do wrong? You taught them to honor God second and everything else first. Amen. Told you, this is a religious region, and when you stomp on idols, that's the kind of feedback you get. Everybody gets real quiet. So hopefully it's not anyone here, but I know it's in this region, and so that way I know it's already washing off on all of us because we're in this region. So, nothing outranks and outweighs God in our heart and our life. So, If you're offended by my go-to-hell statement, be offended, but that's where you're going to send everybody in your lineage if you tell them that that is more important than God. Godly parenting begins with putting God Almighty and His will, not just His name, but Him and His will first in your home. First. As the verse goes, I think I say it every service, seek ye first your sports and your hunting and fishing and all things will be added. No, 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 no. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all things will be added unto you. Amen. Amen.